making hormonal contraceptives more and more readily available perpetuates the idea that women have no control over their fertility or when they get pregnant. Hey, and welcome back to the Spring to Life podcast. I'm Caitlin, your host slash hormone health coach, fertility awareness educator, Pilates instructor, and creator of the Spring to Life method. My goal is to promote feminine body independence and share stories of female resiliency to help you love your body more and unleash your inner superpower, your period. This week, we are touching on current events as the FDA has recently approved the first ever over-the-counter birth control medication here in the United States. So I'm going to offer my two cents and we're going to talk about how this impacts women's health and fertility. All right, this story has been all over my Instagram feed this week. Maybe you have heard about it as well. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has approved the first ever over-the-counter birth control medication here in the United States. It is called O-Pill, and it's actually the mini pill, which is maybe something that you have heard it referred to as before. It's a progestin-only quote unquote, mini pill. And this medication is not new. It was actually first approved by the FDA as a prescription in 1973. So that's why you or someone you know has potentially taken this mini pill as a form of birth control in the past. They have rebranded it as O-Pill for this over-the-counter version, even though it's the same thing. So new name, O-Pill, same medication as it was in 1973. Although it has been approved, it is not available yet. It's not going to be available in stores until about 2024, and there is no price yet. Although I would imagine it's going to have to be fairly low cost if they are marketing it over the counter, and we will talk about why that is. So how effective at preventing pregnancy is this mini pill, is this O-pill? The progestin-only mini pill is 93% effective with typical use. So that means there's little room for error because not everybody is perfect. So with typical use, there is a 7% chance of unwanted pregnancy on the mini pill. I just want to offer as a comparison, a knowledge-based method like the one that I teach, the FEM method. With typical use, this is 92 to 90 8% effective, and there are zero health risks when you're using a knowledge-based method of contraception. With a hormonal contraceptive, there are many risks, and we're going to discuss those. But what's important to remember in this situation is that all methods of birth control are 100% effective during infertile times of a woman's cycle. And I think that that is what we are really glossing over here with this hormonal birth control, is that you're not fertile all of the time. There are only about five to seven days a month when it is possible for a woman to get pregnant when she has a regular cycle. So you have to ask yourself if the risks outweigh the benefits and what your alternatives are. So I'm not here to tell you that you cannot take the mini pill that nobody should buy this over-the-counter birth control. I am an advocate of informed consent. I want you to know what your options are. I want you to know what the risks are so that you can make an informed and educated decision for yourself or potentially help a loved one make an informed and educated decision for them. So who is this O-pill being marketed to? From the reading that I did and just from like making an educated assumption here, we're looking at teenagers and young women without health insurance. Uh, You know, if somebody's looking to buy something over the counter, they probably are not wanting to go pay for a doctor's visit. Maybe they don't have health insurance to cover the copay or whatever of the doctor's visit. So this is something 
that probably teenagers, maybe ones that are not comfortable talking with their parents about being sexually active, which, you know, that's its own scenario there. So they're trying to they're trying to obtain birth control to safeguard themselves to prevent unwanted pregnancies. And in some situations, that may be the best option. And I'm not here to bash on that. I think that, you know, as emergency contraceptives, things like this, they do have a place, but there's something missing from this scenario. And it goes all the way back to like fifth grade health class when you there are like scare tactics <laughs> used to tell you that you're going to have a period and that you are now, you know, able to get pregnant. And it's just you're scared about these things, but you're not informed about the reality of them. And that's something that I think really needs to change so that women do not have to rely on pharmaceutical drugs when there are safe and effective natural options available. And that's what's missing from this scenario, informed consent, because knowledge-based methods of contraception inform a woman about her body. It gives her a deeper understanding of her hormones, her fertility, her biology, how things are working from month to month, and it's it's just so much safer. Hormonal contraceptives leave women uninformed because most of the time when you're taking that form of birth control, you're under the belief that you can get pregnant at any time, so you need to have your bases covered 100% of the time. So obviously I have an issue with this and it's because of my own firsthand experience with birth control. I went in and got a prescription for the pill when I was 21 and there was zero discussion about the possible risks and side effects. She did not ask me about my current mental health state or really anything. You know, I don't even remember talking about my family history in relation to this. So I think that there is a real disservice to women being done, number one, in our education on our own personal health, our menstrual health, our hormonal fluctuations, and number two, on the way hormonal contraceptive, contraceptives are prescribed. So to me, more women on hormonal contraceptives means that more women are going to be suffering from these quote unquote normal symptoms unnecessarily and also putting themselves at risk of some serious complications. I was listening to a podcast today. It was an interview on the Skinny Confidential uh, with the founders of Mind Body Green and the wife in the couple, I believe her name was Colleen. She was telling a story about how she had a pulmonary embolism while she was on the birth control pill. And she thought her symptoms were so normal that she basically gaslit herself into thinking she was okay until she finally went into the doctor and he had to send her to the ER with a sign on her that said pulmonary embolism in case she couldn't speak for herself when she got there. And I have done an interview with Emma Brereton on this podcast. If you go back a few episodes about her life and death experience with hormonal birth control and you know, these things are just kind of brushed under the rug. They're not talked about there. It's joked about how big the list of like directions and complications and risks and side effects are for birth control. And the print is so tiny. Um, but these are serious things that we should be we should be talking about. And another issue that I have with this is when we take hormonal contraceptives, for the most part, we're turning off our ovulation and ovulation is really the main event. Having a period doesn't happen unless you ovulate and that's what your body is working towards each month. So about four in 10 women on the mini pill are still going to ovulate, which number one, increases the risk for unintended pregnancy when use is not perfect because they are still ovulating. There is still the chance that they could get pregnant. And then those six and 10 women that are not ovulating are not producing progesterone. And honestly, the women that are ovulating are probably not producing much natural progesterone either because this is a progestin only pill. It's not biological progesterone, it is a synthetic version. So it's not giving your body the same effects and benefits that real progesterone would. And among these things, uh, progesterone is important for bone health, bone mineral density. It is also super important when it comes to our mental health, especially in the second half of our cycle. 
the lower your progesterone levels are, the higher your risks are for anxiety and depression. And, you know, we want to feel good. We can't feel good if we don't have the hormones in our body that make us feel good. Now, and that's just the risks related to not having progesterone produced. I talk about this all the time on my podcast, but it's been a while (laughs) since I mentioned it. Hormonal contraceptives are classified by the World Health Organization as a class one carcinogen. That is a cancer causing agent. We're talking breast cancer, cervical cancer, things like this that are we don't wanna have. And honestly, why should we have to take these risks? There's also the risk for increased blood clots, increased blood pressure, irregular bleeding, cervical erosion. This one is really important because our cervix is not fully mature until our mid to late 20s. And now this mini pill is being marketed toward teenagers, young women who might not know much else. And so their cervix is not mature. They're taking this hormonal birth control. They're impacting the development of their cervix and that could have implications on their fertility and their sexual wellness as they get older, as their life moves on. There is also the risk for blood sugar imbalance or glucose intolerance, weight gain, excess hair growth, and nutrient deficiencies, which can lead to all sorts of things like gut issues, food sensitivities, you name it. Um, And this is just my short list that I wanted to include in the podcast. So while having over-the-counter birth control might be the best choice for some women, I, be, I strongly believe that it's only because we have this gap in our education. I'm so passionate about this because I didn't learn these things. I didn't learn about my fertility until I was in my mid to late 20s. And I felt like I had, you know, I had lived so much life not knowing this. I might have made different choices when it comes to contraception, when it comes to how I use my energy, when it comes to how I even think about my body and my body image and my perception of myself. So I see this huge gap in our education in the way that women are taught about their bodies. And that is why I believe that giving women the freedom of informed consent when it comes to their choice of contraceptives is the best way to support health and vitality. Now, that doesn't mean I think that we should just take all of those options off the shelves and deny access of contraception to, you know, the masses. But I do think that we need to really take action. So if you are somebody that is listening to this podcast, I really hope that with your loved ones in your life, you are sharing this message. We need to take action as women to educate ourselves on fertility, sharing with friends and loved ones, passing on the knowledge to the next generation, whether that's daughters, nieces, just the people in your life. The more that we share this information, the more common knowledge it becomes, the less we will have to rely on pharmaceutical drugs that impact our overall health and well-being. And as I was preparing to record this episode, I was thinking about how crazy it is that this is the life of women. Men are not expected to take pharmaceuticals like this. And honestly, because of the impacts on our health, I would not expect them to. And that is actually a discussion that I had with my partner when I decided, you know, for good that I am not going to be on any type of pharmaceutical contraceptive, hormonal or not. And when I talked about it with him, he was like, you know, I totally understand because if you asked me to go get something like that, I probably wouldn't do it. And, you know, as women, we've been expected to bear the weight of this part of life of, you know, our sexual wellness and our fertility and family planning. But there are so many other options that we have when it comes to just getting more acquainted with our bodies, with our biomarkers, learning to understand our fertility and taking responsibility for it. I think that that's a big part of it too. I think that making hormonal contraceptives more and more readily available perpetuates the idea that women have no control over their fertility or when they get pregnant. But that couldn't be farther from the truth. We have so much control and it just takes a little bit of time to learn about it. 
And then once you do, it's just ingrained in you. It's not something that you're going to easily forget. And it's just going to be something that you're used to learning about. So I, you know, I just had to throw my opinion into the arena. And, you know, maybe it's some food for thought. I think that taking hormonal contraceptives, especially for a long period of time, really disconnects women from who they truly are, how they truly feel, and it just kind of numbs you out and it makes you a better worker bee because you're not experiencing your hormonal fluctuations. You're not experiencing that moon cycle and you're more accustomed to living with the 24 hour clock that men operate on. And, you know, for some people, for some times in their life, that works, but For the most part, I find that when women go back to their truest self, they take out all of the pharmaceuticals um, that are unnecessary and really tune into their cycle, there's so much more peace. You're not working against yourself. You're not working against your energy. You're embracing it and using it to your advantage. And it shouldn't be a bad thing to embrace your hormones because that's how your body works. You were built this way for a reason. Uh, whether you want to have children or not. You know, I don't use hormonal contraceptives, but becoming pregnant is not a goal of mine. And I feel comfortable with that choice. And, you know, there's so much fear instilled in us as women. I think taking responsibility and knowing that there are other options, having informed consent, making educated choices, whether it is for the hormonal contraceptive or not, having the freedom to have the informed consent the, making the informed decision is really paramount here. So that's my soapbox for today. I hope you enjoyed this little rant of mine and it was all cohesive. I would be so grateful if you could share this episode with your friends, your sisters, your girlfriends, your loved ones, so that we can spread more of this knowledge. Thank you so much for joining me today for this episode of the Spring to Life podcast. If you resonated with this conversation, I would be so grateful if you could share it with your friends, tag me in your Instagram stories, or even leave a review. Leaving reviews and ratings really helps other women find this show and connect with our message. If you do choose to share on social media, media, tag me in your Instagram stories. I'm at spring to life method. And uh, yeah, keep sharing because all women deserve to know their superpower. And if you are interested in learning more about your unique superpower, I still have a few spots left in my program, Get Synced. This is a three month hybrid of one-on-one and self-guided challenges that you are able to access through my app. It is a combination of habit coaching and Pilates instruction to help you balance your hormones, regulate your cycle, achieve your unique hormonal health goals, and just build the foundation for a really hormone supportive lifestyle. And I know that you are just going to feel amazing by the end of three months. So if you want to get in on one of these last few spaces that are available, this is the last time that I'm going to offer it at $45 a month. That is half off of what the price is going to be once these spots fill up. So I will drop that link in the show notes. You can also DM me or send me an email if you'd like more information on the program. And I will talk to you next week.